Good afternoon, everybody. Let's get started. So for announcements, you have Lab 10 uh, continued this week. So uh, this week you should, uh, if you haven't yet demonstrated to your TAs that your circuit works and that you're able to test a real remote control, then uh, you'll do that this Friday. Be sure to bring in a remote control, an infrared remote control, or be able to borrow uh, one from others. I know we had a one or two floating around lab last week, but if you want to be sure to have one, definitely uh, bring one along. And let's see here. Get a setting set here. Okay, so homework eight. Homework eight is the next homework due, and I've actually changed the due date to Wednesday 5-3, May 3rd, so that we can have more time to go over the uh, digital material to prepare you for that homework. Uh, we will have a clicker today, so be sure to have your clicker application ready to answer those clicker questions. And if you have any questions during class, please chat or unmute, and I will get to those during class. So uh, last time we talked about digital logic, combinatorial logic, and how to take a function or a decision that you want to make that you describe in a truth table and convert that to logic gates, right? So now you could put logic gates on a, on a board, on an electronics board, a breadboard, wire them together and uh, make a decision with, with those gates. As we move forward into microcontrollers, which we're going to get to today, I wanna to talk a little bit about how maybe more complex operations are performed in logic, such as um, uh, adding numbers together, okay? And I want to show you how you can create gates out of transistors. So that way, if you can imagine how to perform operations like addition with gates, and you can imagine, you can see how to create gates using transistors, then you can make the leap from going from, uh, uh, from transistors to math operations. So that's what I want to cover today. Oh, let's get my arrow up here. So, so let's talk about creating gates from transistors, or what I say, going from transistors to gates. Here, for example, is an OR gate. Okay, so I have two transistors. I have a power supply, uh, six volts up here. Uh, on the left, I have two inputs, and on the right, I have an output and then one resistor here. So let's take a look at how this works. So uh, the output is connected to this four, the top of this 4.7K ohm resistor. And if these transistors are in cutoff, in other words, they're off, they're like open switches, then the output's connected directly to ground. Now let's take an input A, for example, and let's say I have, uh, I apply five volts to input A here. And let's say that this 10K ohm resistor allows this top transistor to saturate. So if I apply five volts here to the input A and I saturate this transistor, that transistor is connecting essentially uh, the six volt source to the output. So the output goes high, right? And if I, um, if I have B low and A low, both of these transistors are in cutoff. So neither transistor connects that high uh, level, that plus six volts to the output. So the output would remain low because it's connected to ground through that resistor. If I bring B high, apply five volts or six volts to that input, I saturate transistor B here, that would connect six volts to the output uh, and I get a high. Uh, and then some current flows through that resistor, that 4.7K ohm resistor. If I connect five volts to A and five volts to B, then both of these transistors saturate, they both connect six volts to the output and I get a high at the output. So the only way you get a low at the output is if you have A and B low. And then if you have either or both, a and B high, um, then, then the output goes high. That's an OR gate. That's the definition of an OR gate. That's how we drew the, wrote out the truth table. Okay, so that's how you create an OR gate. Uh, 
An AND gate would look like this. If you take two transistors, configure them a little differently. I still have two inputs, uh, A and B, and I have an output down here above that 4.7K ohm resistor. So now in order to connect the six volt source to the output, I need to saturate both of these transistors. So I have to bring A high and B high to saturate those transistors to connect the source to the output. Otherwise, if I have either or both A and B low, okay, then that connection to the source, six volts, is broken and the output will be low because it's connected to ground through that um, 4.7K ohm resistor. So, so those are two conceptual implementations of how you could create an OR gate and an AND gate uh, using transistors. So you can imagine there's ways to create all of these gates using, using transistors. And then when we express the circuit uh, for, uh, for a logical function, we don't use transistors, we just use gates and we know how to build up those gates. Okay, so now let me take you from gates to math operations. So we went from transistor, transistors to gates, let me take you from gates to math operations. Okay, so here is a circuit. I have two gates, an XOR gate and an AND gate. I have two inputs, A and B, and I have this output S and an output C. Let's take a look at the output S and how that relates to the inputs A and B. Okay, so um, if I have two numbers I want to add, two binary numbers I, I want to add together. Let's take that number a bit at a time. Let's imagine I want to add one plus one, okay? just one bit plus one bit. Well, if I have A zero and B zero, I'm adding A and B, I get an S, the sum bit, as zero. If I add A plus B and A is one and B is zero, I should get a one as the output for the sum bit. If I add a plus b and I have a0, b1, I should get 1 as the sum. And if I have a1 and b1 and I add those two together, I get 0 as the sum bit, right? Well, 1 plus 1 is not 0. Well, except for that bit in that column, if you're adding binary numbers together, 1 plus 1 is 0. For example, here, if I add one plus one, and those are two bit numbers, right, two bit words, one plus one is two. So, but in this digit, in this bit, one plus one is zero and you carry the one and then you add those three uh, numbers together. One plus zero plus zero equals one. Okay, so if I look at the overall numbers that I'm adding, a binary one, a binary one, one plus one is two. So for this rightmost bit here, that is what this half adder is doing. It's telling you the sum of those two bits, one plus one. And then it provides a carry bit, this C bit, that goes into the next column when you're adding these numbers together. Okay, This is just like decimal addition that we're more familiar with. If I have 6 plus 7, I get 3. Well, 6 plus 7 isn't 3, but for that digit, you do get three, you carry the one, and then one plus zero plus zero is one. Six plus seven is 13. Okay, so that's what this half adder does. It is the rightmost uh, bit addition in a, in a, um, for a byte or for a, for, for a word, I should say, in that uh, rightmost bit position. Now, turn back a little bit the clock, and I said that the, the XOR gate is a modulo two addition. This is what modulo two addition is. When I add one plus one, the only valid output is a zero or one, it's modulo two. And so um, a modulo in modulo two addition, like when you're adding two bits together, one plus one is zero, okay? So what do we do with that carry bit? And what do we do with the bits to the left of that right, right most bit? Well, you use a full adder, and a full adder takes in not only the two bits 
that are being added in that column, but also the carry input for the bit one position to the right. So you have uh, what five gates here, a couple XOR gates, an OR gate, a couple AND gates, and then you can see on the on the right in this table, uh, if the carry in is zero, then you get the the same um, the same truth table as the half adder. Zero plus zero is zero. Zero plus one is one. One plus zero is one. One plus one is zero, and the carry output is a one, so that's just like a half adder. If the carry input uh, is a one, like my example up here, right? If you have zero plus zero and you have the one as a carry, right? Zero plus zero plus one, right? that's the carry in, you get uh, the sum bit equal to one, which is this um, bit on the left here, right? So if I put a half adder and a full adder together, I can add two bit numbers together. If I if I put more full adders together, one for each of the bits, let's say I have one half adder and seven full adders, I can add bytes together. I can add eight bit numbers together. And so this whole table uh, defines what this full adder does. And then you see you have the carry out. So uh, one plus one is zero, carry the one. And one plus one plus one is one, carry the one. So you can see how this behaves here. So what you're doing here, what we've, we've shown in a couple slides is you can take transistors and create gates and then take gates and create these functions that add binary numbers together, right? So now I can have a circuit that, that adds two binary words together and gives you a result, okay? So you can imagine that in, in a microcontroller, which we're going to get to, there is a, there's a circuit like this, so it can add 32-bit numbers together and then give you a result. All right. So let's um, let me give you a shot at figuring out what is this logic gate. So what logic gate is implemented here? Um, you have a transistor. There is an input on the left, which is zero volts or five volts and a resistor up here connected to a power supply, five volts. And here is the output off of the collector of that transistor. So, um, and, and imagine that, well, don't imagine, I will tell you when five volts is applied to this input terminal, this transistor is saturated. So figure out what that is, what, uh, what logic gate is implemented here. So one hint I'll give you is how many inputs are there? Um, your answer should correspond to a logic gate that has the same number of inputs. All right, take another 15 seconds. See if you can get the answer here. All right, let's call time on this one. So let's look at how this circuit responds to inputs of either uh, zero volts or or five volts. Um, let's look at an input value and the corresponding output value. If I apply zero volts to this input, then a transistor is in cutoff. There's no current flowing through that transistor. 
So if there's no current flowing through that transistor, then there's no current flowing through that resistor above. So there's zero volts then by Ohm's law, zero volts across that resistor. So the output would equal five volts. That would be a logic level one. So this logic gate takes a logic level zero as an input, produces a logic level one as an output. If I have five volts applied, logic level one to the input, that would saturate this transistor. Let's assume the saturation voltage is about 0.2 volts or less, like you saw in lab. Then I get about zero, volt, zero volts at the output. That would be a logic level zero. So I've taken a one, logic level one, at the input, produced a logic level zero at the output. Uh, so that is a logical inverter. And the answer is B. No, D. <laughs> D. Any questions on this circuit or this concept? So the, the five volts at the top, that's not a um, that's not an input. That's just always like that. That's right. That's just a power supply up there. Uh, OK. Mm -hmm. Right. So the inputs down here on the left, that's the one that changes and the output here on the right. All right. So we have reached another milestone in the course uh, on our roadmap. Let's take a look at that roadmap. So we've been through all of the circuits part of the course. We went through the electronics part of the course, talking about uh, diodes, transistors, and op amps. And we just finished up talking about logic circuits um, and digital systems. So now we're going to apply that knowledge to a survey of microcontrollers. So let's move on to uh, microcontrollers. Okay, so um, what I'm going to give you in this course is an overview of microcontroller technology, what, what they do, what they can do, uh, a little bit about how to use them. Many of you have taken uh, an intro to engineering or a projects class uh, that, that where, where you've actually programmed a microcontroller, probably an Arduino, maybe, maybe not, it doesn't matter uh, if you've done that or not, but this should look familiar if you've, if you've programmed a microcontroller before. So what I hope to take you through is, uh, is just giving you an overview of what they do, um, basically how they're programmed, what some of the, the, the peripherals are and how you might use them. And then I'll give you some examples of problems you would be expected to solve regarding microcontrollers in this class. Okay, so, so let's take a look at uh, uh, logic integrated circuits, what we just finished, just as a, as a review or setting up for talking about microcontrollers. So we talked about combinatorial logic gates like the NAND gate and the inverter, right? Those are combinatorial logic. You have inputs and outputs. There's no memory. The output corresponds to the present inputs, right? There's no, no uh, well, there, there's no memory that uh, such that the logic gates respond to past inputs. There are also integrated circuits and logic called sequential logic. And a sequential logic gate um, is something like this, a counter. So a counter, when typical counters, typical integrated circuits, when they count in binary, um, for every clock edge, like a rising edge of a clock, they will increment their binary count, right? So you get a rising clock, a rising edge from zero volts to five volts, and the counter increments. And then you get an, uh, the edge falls, let's say the input falls, and then you get another rising edge, and the counter increments again. And so in order for a counter to increment to the next value, it has to have knowledge of the past value. So sequential logic gates have memory. They store the state of, in this case, uh, I think it's a four-bit word here. Um, 
we're not going to dig into sequential logic. Just know that they exist and they're considered uh, logic integrated circuits. So in uh, for discrete logic, when I say discrete logic, I mean these individual chips that perform logic functions. Uh, each IC performs a specific logic operation. Okay, so if you need if you need an OR gate, you have to put an OR gate chip in the circuit. If you need a, an exclusive OR, you use a different chip. And the functions are created by wiring uh, the IC pins together. Okay, so if you have to create the circuit, you want to create the circuit like we worked on when I went from a Boolean expression and drew a circuit on the whiteboard, those are wires connecting these gates together. Power the chips, wire the ICs together, and you get that Boolean function. If you need a different type of function or you run out of gates, let's say you need seven inverters, well, you have to add another integrated circuit, you add another chip. Okay, so. It's, it's uh, these um, chips are used to build logic functions in hardware. Hardware logic integrated circuit advantages are, well, they're inexpensive, they're simple. If you only need a few logical functions, a few logic gates, they're, they're not advantageous. Here are their disadvantages. Uh, they are uh, they use relatively large packaging in other words a large amount of space used so if you have a small product and you want to cram a lot into a lot of logic into a, a small package these probably aren't the way to go and they're not easily reprogrammable you can't um you can't just uh program in software these these chips you have to move wires if you want to change the logic function you may have to add or remove chips depending upon how you want to reprogram the logic Okay, so, so they have advantages and disadvantages. Life, life is a trade. Let's look at microcontrollers and microprocessors. Talk about the purpose and some of their applications. So what is a microcontroller? It is an integrated circuit typically used to sense, let's say physical quantities or measure physical quantities and act as a part of a control system. Right, so the output of the microcontroller can control something based on um, what it senses uh, from the outside world. Okay, uh, so that's a microcontroller. I want to contrast that with a microprocessor. I'm sure you've heard the term microprocessor being applied to PCs. So a microprocessor is an IC, integrated circuit, typically used to process data or perform calculations at high rates for applications. So when you're using Microsoft Office, you're playing a game, you're browsing the web, there's a lot of, there are a lot of calculations going on there actually, a lot of computation to create the graphics on the screen, right? To um, determine what, uh, what data you're sending over the internet to decode data coming from the internet, okay? So there's a lot of processing going on. Microprocessors typically used for that um, versus sensing, right? You're not, you're not typically, uh, sensing temperature and motion and things like that with a microprocessor, you usually do that with a microcontroller. Microcontrollers generally have more peripherals than microprocessors to support sensing and control, but they're generally slower than microprocessors for computing. Now there's, there's a, a reason for that. It's not intentional. You don't artificially want something slower, but microcontrollers generally use very low power, right? You might have a battery operated device and you want it to run for six months off of a 1.5 volt battery. Um, you wouldn't get your PC to run six months off a 1.5 volt battery. And that speed difference is correlated with the power consumption. So in order to use less power, microcontrollers are generally slower, but they have more peripherals for sensing and controlling and timing. Microcontrollers and microprocessors both have software definable logic functions. And what you do is use a PC typically to create software and download the instructions into the microcontroller's memory. That's how you make it work. Um, microcontrollers have lots of capability, right? I don't know how many pins this is. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Looks like about 28 pins here. But uh, despite only having 28 pins, Microcontrollers generally have many, many capabilities. Um, and for example, the common Atmega 328P 
That's the microcontroller on the Arduino Uno. It has a 294 page data sheet describing its capabilities and how to use them. So you saw some data sheets in lab. You saw the LED had uh, you know, a couple pages on, on what, it, what it did, what it does. Um, if you look at the op amp, it might have you know, five pages of useful information on what it does. Microcontrollers generally have hundreds of pages because there's so much you can do with them. And we'll talk about a few of those peripherals and capabilities here. Okay. Um, and microcontrollers come in many packages and many physical sizes. So this is the microcontroller that you'll see on the Arduino board plugged into a socket. Uh, here is a uh, another form factor of that same microcontroller, right? And, and here's another one. Uh, in fact, I think these have more pins, so you get more access to those functions inside simultaneously. There are really small microcontrollers, like eight pin microcontrollers that you can buy for very simple functions. Okay, and one of the popular microcontrollers that I've, I've mentioned, um, typically used by especially hobbyists and experimenters, but often professionally for rapid development projects is, is the Arduino. Uh, the Arduino is actually not a microcontroller itself. It's a family of development boards like the Arduino Uno that's shown here. Um, now it's a board, this Arduino Uno is a board that uses a microcontroller. And this particular microcontroller that it's using is the Atmega uh, 328P, used to be made by Atmel, that's the manufacturer. Atmel was acquired by Microchip, so now it's a microchip. Co the company's name is Microchip. It's their microcontroller now after the acquisition. Um, so, so the Arduino is really a board that uses a microcontroller. And then there are various versions of Arduino boards. You get the Mega, you get the, I don't know, there's a Nano, there's a, there are different versions of that board with, they use different microcontrollers. Um, they have become very popular. So the reason you see Arduinos is because there's a large community of users, both amateur and professional, and a correspondingly large amount of support on the web. So if you need help with something, someone's probably run into that problem before. So why did this get so popular? Well, uh, the company made it very, who made Arduino, made it very easy to program. They just took away a few frustrating steps and a few things that would cost you money to get into programming microcontrollers. They made it very easy. You just plug the board into your USB port on your PC and they have a very easy to use um, integrated development environment, the compiler, and they use some simplified terminology and give you some good libraries and then everybody starts using it. So you get even better open source libraries. Um, so so that, that making it easy made it become very popular. And so that's why there's a, there's a large support uh, base out there for it. Um, so micro, let's look at microcontrollers versus logic gates versus the discrete logic chips that we talked about. So the advantages of a microcontroller are that um, they're inexpensive to use to implement numerous functions because you have a lot of memory. And if you need, you know, 200 logic gates to implement something, you can do that pretty easily in an Arduino. Uh, 200 logic gates would be a very large circuit um, in, in a uh, uh, discrete logic. Uh, they are reprogrammable, so there's no rewiring if you want to change whatever you've made your board do. You can do sequential programming, which means like in logic gates, typically uh, you have an input and you have an output based on those inputs. And then maybe what you want to do next is based on um, uh, the state of that output, maybe the state of that output you know, three clock cycles ago. That lets you do sequential programming and also you can do um, branching so you can make decisions and run different parts of your program based on conditions in the software. And they're available in small packages for the amount of functionality built into them. So disadvantages are that they require a software development environment. So, you know, if you just need three logic gates, you put just to do something, some kind of project, 
and put logic gates on a board, on a breadboard, and it'll work. You don't need to install a software development environment, go up the learning curve, learn how to program it, debug it. Um, if you only have a few uh, logic gates, this can be overkill, okay? Now, there are very small, cheap microcontrollers where it might make sense, but you probably, if you just needed a couple logic functions, wouldn't buy this board and use it for just a few logic functions. Um, and generally, microcontrollers are slow compared to high-speed logic gates. Uh, a microcontroller like this might take, you know, milliseconds to give you a result, uh, maybe, maybe tens or hundreds of microseconds, right? And that may, might seem fast, but logic gates can give you a result in nanoseconds. So if you really need something timed with very low latency, then logic gates are a, are a good choice. Okay, um, one thing I leave out here, I don't have a slide on this, but I want to mention field programmable gate arrays, FPGAs. FPGAs are a modern way to implement high-speed logic uh, on a chip called an FPGA. Um, and so you're actually, you're actually programming the hardware inside the chip to be discrete logic gates. And then those build up into higher level functions. So I'm not gonna get into those now, but I just wanna mention that's out there. That's an option if you need a high density of logic functions and higher level functions made out of logic gates um, in, a, in a small area, you could look at FPGAs. They're not for the faint of heart. They are, um, there's a learning curve to get into those. Microcontrollers are easy to get into. Um, if you can, in a weekend, you can learn how to do something useful with a microcontroller like the Arduino. Let's talk about embedded systems. So microcontrollers are typically part of an embedded system. Okay. So uh, what is an embedded system? An embedded system has a controller. When I say controller, I mean either a microcontroller or possibly a microprocessor. Right, it has controller hardware and software that forms some component of a larger mechanical slash electronic system. Okay, and usually that system is expected to function without the need for human intervention or without the need for much human intervention. Maybe there's some kind of user interface to control settings. The processor of an embedded system supports the operation of the product, but it's not the point. It's not the main reason for having the product, right? So um, if, you know, for example, if you have a, a dishwasher, right? And it has a microcontroller or an embedded system in it, you just care that your dishwasher, you know, works in the right order of operations. It rinses after it washes and the microcontroller controls that, but you don't really care that there's a processor in there. Uh, in your PC, you do care how fast your processor is because then your MATLAB runs faster and you can use your CAD, uh, CAD software faster without it lagging. Um, products that have sense and control functions probably have microcontrollers in them. All, most modern products, um, especially with some kind of mechanical control, uh, have microcontrollers or they have application specific integrated circuits with, with microcontroller functionality. Okay, so, uh, you know, microcontrollers can be used for prototyping or small quantity products. If you're making something like an iPhone, you're probably going to make a special IC uh, for that product because of the high volumes. But for example, appliances like your refrigerator, uh, your refrigerator has to, um, have a have a thermostat it has to tell you when the filter needs changing it has to turn the light on and off right it has to do lots of things and that's a good candidate for uh for a microcontroller again you don't care how many megahertz that micro or gigahertz right that microcontroller is how much memory it has you don't really care um, you just want your food to be cold and the light to come on and give you water when you want it a more complex example so uh automotive um, applications, right? You can think of an analog brake system. That's one function of many functions in a car that's managed by some kind of vehicle controller. Uh, and, and again, that might be some specific integrated circuit because of the high volume, but it still has some kind of software programmable uh, functionality that that is acts just like a microcontroller. Um, aircraft have 
lots of systems. I like to use aircraft for um, examples because there are, you have to monitor uh, engine temperatures. You have to uh, monitor um, uh, attitude of the aircraft, right? With accelerometers, you have to monitor pressure sensors for airspeed and altitude, and you have to have a closed loop control system for autopilots, right? Based on um, inputs from an inertial measurement unit. So that's a, that's a, um, you know, aircraft have lots of instrumentation. Um, they're good candidates for microcontrollers that are controlled by software. And there's just so many applications, industrial applications, controlling some function of a plant, um, getting your product to come out right of the plant, tuning that control loop in industrial applications. So lots of, lots of functions for or lots of applications for microcontrollers and embedded systems. So an embedded system is the system, is that electronic system that has a microcontroller uh, that fits into these applications. Okay, microcontrollers span a wide range of functionality and cost. Uh, you can get microcontrollers, like I said, with eight pins up to over a hundred pins on a microcontroller if you need lots of input and output because you have that many sensors or peripherals. Okay, contrast an embedded system or a microcontroller to a to a personal computer, right? So your PC, you don't have a lot of you know temperature sensors immediately connected to your PC or you know strain gauges connected directly to your PC. You might have peripherals, you might have auxiliary devices that then connect over USB and your PC processes that data or stores that data, but generally you don't have uh, you don't you don't connect um, analog signals right to your PC and do processing there. It's just the wrong tool for the job. So let's take a look at a really basic um, application, but it, although it's basic, it has a lot of the elements of what you would want a, a realistic microcontroller application to have. Okay, so here's an exam example application, a scale that has a sensor, it has user input, and it has user output. So over here on the left, right, we have a weight, we want to measure that weight. On the right, we have a user interface. It's a seven segment display with three digits. And all you want, right, is, is, is the weight of the weight um, displayed on the interface. In the center here is the microcontroller. The microcontroller is the brains of the operation. It's going to take in information about the weight. It's going to take in user input about what units uh, the weight should be in. It's going to output digital data to be displayed on the screen. OK, so on the left here, uh, we have strain gauges or a load cell in a Wheatstone bridge. And what that produces is a very small voltage change based on the weight. So when the weight is not on the load cell, you might get zero volts between V plus and V minus here. And when you put the weight on, you might get like 0.8 millivolts or like, like I showed with the strain gauge example from a few weeks ago. Well, that's not very useful. That voltage range from zero to 0.8 millivolts is not very useful when you're sampling it with an analog to digital converter that spans, let's say five volts. So you need some kind of amplifier. So this is signal conditioning. So if you hear signal conditioning, it means basically converting what might be an unusable voltage to a usable voltage. I want to point this out because you know how to do this now. You could build an amplifier that takes, uh, takes this voltage and amplifies it by 100 or amplifies it by 1,000 using op amps. Okay, so you could do something like that. And then you'd have uh, a voltage that's usable by an analog to digital converter, which converts a range of analog voltages to a range of digital binary values. So if you have a, an eight bit analog to digital converter, the output of that eight bit ADC is going to be zero to 255, right? At its minimum voltage in, let's say zero volts, you'd have zero here. At its maximum, right? Let's say it's five volts, you'd have 255. And then you, you have to scale in between. You have to match up, well, okay, what's 3.8 volts in binary? Or if I have binary you know, 82, what's that correspond to in volts? Well, that's a linear equation you could write and implement in the microcontroller. So the microcontroller in, in software 
takes that 8-bit value and converts it to, well, how many ounces is that? Right? First it says maybe how many volts, and then it does a volt to ounce based on the strain gauge. Uh, how many ounces is that? The microcontroller takes input, takes uh, a, a selection of units, grams or ounces, maybe it tears the scale by setting the zero. And then the microcontroller provides the output in a format that can be displayed on the user inter interface. So a lot of these LCD displays have some kind of controller that take um, commands to clear the screen and turn the light on, turn the light off, or um, you know the, the values that should be displayed here. And so then you get the user interface output. But this is a typical, this is a good microcontroller application. It takes sensing in, it gives some useful useful display out, right? It has some output um, and, and it has some kind of user input. There's no closed loop control here, but you can imagine um, a system that would have maybe some kind of closed loop control. So let's dig into this microcontroller a bit. Uh, what is inside and how does this work in a block diagram form? So here is how many microcontrollers work. Um, the brains of the operation is this central processing unit, the CPU. It has what's called an ALU, an arithmetic logic unit that performs math computations. And it also has uh, internal registers for temporarily storing values so that I can operate on those values. Um, and so there's program memory. That's where your program gets stored. So when you download a program from the Arduino IDE and put it into flash memory, this is where it goes. Uh, this is data memory. This is where variables and values get stored. So if you say A equals 1, B equals 2, C equals A plus B, um, those variables get stored in data memory, not program memory. Okay. And then there are input and output ports that give you access to the outside world. So reading in digital values from the outside world um, or outputting digital values. Okay. And then there's this clock. So a clock is not a time of day clock. It's actually just a square wave. And usually these CPUs act on the edges of the square wave. So if you have some kind, so so you might have um, a CPU that that performs an operation on the rising edge of the square wave. So and I'll, I'll describe that. So a uh, operation might look like this. Well, let me describe the data bus, the data bus and the address bus. When uh, when you want to access, let's say, uh, uh, program memory or or data memory, you put an address of the memory. It's like a, the post office box number of whatever the contents is that you want to grab uh, on the bus. And then you're going to, let's say you're reading memory, you're going to read over the data bus uh, the value. Okay, that's what the CPU does. That's what the data bus and address bus do. They give you uh, a way to specify an address of memory and grab the values, which is the data. So operation might look something like this. You have um, a program. You download it into program memory. There's usually something called a program counter, and it just starts at zero. It says, give me instruction zero, and then counts up one, two, three, four, five. So the CPU says, OK, program counter is zero. Uh, give me instruction zero. So it goes out over the address bus to get instruction zero, and then it pulls on the data uh, the, the instruction that it should execute. And let's suppose that X, that instruction is um, add A plus B. And those are two memory locations in data memory. So the CPU says, OK, now I have to go fetch the data from memory. So give me, at the location of variable A, give me the data, bring it into a register. Uh, uh, and then it says, let's go get B. The pr uh, I, ha I have to perform an add. So uh, over the address bus, it'll address location for variable B, get that value for B, put it in a register, and then it'll execute an add function. So just like we saw in um, when I was adding numbers with gates, right? that would be in the CPU to perform that kind of operation to add binary numbers together and give you a result that would be stored in an internal register 
register as just temporary memory inside the CPU. And so now it has the value of C and it's going to put that value of C back in memory so you can access it later or it can access it later. So it specifies an address for where to write and then it puts the value there. And so you've added A plus B, you've stored it in the memory location of C and then you move on to the next instruction. So every little instruction happens like that. And this is happening constantly as you run a program in the, in the microcontroller. If you want to, let's say, control something in the outside world, a lot of times these input and output ports, which we'll talk about, are, are memory mapped. So if you write to a certain place in memory, uh, let's say an 8-bit word, that value will show up at eight pins on the microcontroller because it knows to map the memory to those pins on the microcontroller. Okay, so but that's, that, that is a you know, three minute overview on how a microcontroller works, but it should give you an idea of the important architectural components inside. The CPU is the brains. You store programs in memory. The CPU fetches those instructions for that program. It uses data memory to store data and retrieve data, and it can control the outside world uh, using the uh, input and output ports. And then this clock is where, okay, so, so every time I describe something happening, like fetch an instruction, uh, get data, uh, put data, that happens on each rising edge of this clock, okay? And so one instruction may take, let's say, four clock cycles because it has to fetch, it has to pull data from memory, it has to perform its operation, it has to store that memory. Okay, so that all, it's, it's, all that stuff is going on. But usually when you're just programming these, you don't have to know all that. It helps sometimes to know, but um, uh, you, know, you, you don't have to dig too deep in order to make these microcontrollers useful. So let's, let's, let's go from deep in the microcontroller and back out farther. Here is an example of a microcontroller development board. So, Often development boards are produced so that you don't have to make your own circuit board for your application if you're prototyping. And that's what is good. Uh, th that's what this is good for, this Arduino board. And again, there are many different development boards from Texas Instruments, from analog devices, um, uh, from, from different manufacturers that have their own development boards and different controllers with different capabilities. So on this board, this is the Atmel slash microchip Atmega328. That's the microcontroller itself. That's the chip. That's the microcontroller. These boards typically have features so that so to, to, to make it easy for you to use this um, microcontroller, like this board has a USB programming and power interface, right? And if you don't want to use USB power, you can alternately supply your own power um, if you don't want to drain your laptop battery, for example. Uh, there's a voltage regulator, right? so, so that brings down whatever voltage you um, apply. Let's, let's say you apply 12 volts as an input, and this Arduino uses 5 volts, then you have to regulate 12, 12 volts down to 5 volts. And then you might have to do some filtering, so this should look familiar. We talked about the decoupling capacitors that you put around chips. Here are two big capacitors that are meant to filter the power supply so that if you have any noise coming in on the wires from the outside world, these capacitors, because they look like a low impedance at high frequencies, right? Minus J times one over omega C, omega's in the denominator. At high at AC, uh, these look like shorts to ground, okay? Uh, here's, here's the clock uh, oscillator. This is the square wave generator. This is where I showed on the lower right of the previous slide. This is the, the, uh, the crystal that generates, that sets the frequency of the oscillator for this microcontroller. Um, here's a USB interface chip that actually takes uh, the burden of converting from USB to serial to program this chip. Okay, and then there are these header pins. These are just uh, places where you can plug breadboard wires in and get access to the microcontroller pins and access to different signals on the board. Okay, so, so I like to use the Arduino because many, many of you have seen it. Um, and if you haven't, this is what it looks like. And here are some of the components of that board. 
so that uh, microcontroller pins and peripherals. So what I'd like to do, let's see, let's just <clears throat> dig into this a little bit. So for, uh, we talked about digital signals and those are the digital ports. Okay, so you're going to see homework problems where you have a, a microcontroller as a box. So this is what I want you to picture when you see a microcontroller label inside of a box that has a few pins. So uh, when you imagine this, right, picture those pins, those terminals coming out of that square box are these ports here. They're actually uh, digital connections, digital ports that connect to this microcontroller. They are input or output logic signals, meaning zeros or ones. And if you have a three volt microcontroller, zero volts or three volts. And if you have a five volt microcontroller, zero volts or five volts representing logic values, zero or one, okay? So you'll see that in your next homework. I think you'll see a box that says microcontroller, I think, or at least in one of the examples we do. And so when you picture that, picture this diagram here, and we'll continue talking about this next time. All right, so I've hit the wall on time. Um, so lab 10, you will continue this week. And so be sure to bring in a remote control, find someone with a remote control so you can test your, your circuit. Uh, and then also this, this Friday, you will be turning in your lockers. So whatever check-in procedure, we're going to arrange that for the locker check-in because this is your last lab. Um, homework eight is due next Wednesday, May 3rd. And so take a look at that, that's on Canvas. Thanks for joining class. If you have any questions, stop by office hours. I will start those in just a few seconds. So if I see you there, uh, come, come join. If you want to join office hours, if not, I will see you next time. Have a great night.